We realize that many of you have to go to class, but those of you that can stay for question and answers, um, there's a microphone down here on your right. And if you'll just step down here and ask your questions in just a minute while everyone is exiting. Thank you for coming. We really do appreciate seeing you. Get all those symbols. Sure. Talk about the prosperity, the dominion. I just wanted to. I'll uh, I'll do you one better. I'll give it to you, and you can copy it down somewhere. Is that the one you wanted? Yeah. Okay, um, if those of you that are leaving um, could depart, <laughs> and we will have those that want to ask questions. I see there's some people that have questions. Um, come on down and ask your question if there's, no? If you'll uh, go over to the microphone, and pretend like you're really important. <laughs> I'm interested to know about the symbolism of the, the all seeing eye. Um, we saw it in a couple of the slides. I don't know if you could say what it actually kind of means, what the Egyptians were connected to Mark. Um, to give uh, most of you, I assume, are Latter day Saints, to give you a context for the question. If you turn to facsimile number two of the Pearl of Great Price, you will see the Wedget Eye uh, listed about four different times. So it's a very, very important symbol uh, to the ancient Egyptians. And it's sometimes called the Eye of Horus. Uh, there's a mythological story about how Horus, uh, uh, the son of Isis and Osiris, lost his eye. But the, but the Wedget Eye is... Um, the equivalent of the all-seeing eye, that nothing escapes the notice of the gods, and that, uh, and that even though in Egyptian temples there are not a lot of ways that one can express personal piety, uh, there are still occasions uh, during which individuals can go and plead for uh, some special uh, uh, kind of help, some blessing uh, to resolve some conflict or challenge in their lives that they believe that the patron deity of that particular temple uh, can help with. And it is interesting that uh, in those areas we see representations of the Wedget Eye, uh, the Eye of Horus, the All-Seeing Eye, and in fact in some temples, um, the, the, uh, the deity is known as he who sees everything. And, uh, and as a result of being able to see everything and know everything about the petitioner, uh, he, is, uh, he or she is better able to grant the petition of the individual worshiper. So the Wedget Eye uh, is a very important concept uh, in ancient Egyptian religion, and it goes back to the idea of the all-powerful gods being able to and being benevolent enough to watch over the Egyptian people and, uh, and to uh, help them through this life so that they can pass through the portal into that stream of existence known as eternity. So that's the Wedget Eye. And there's been lots of literature written about the, the Wedget Eye, but if, you, uh, if you're um, interested to, in a starting place, go to facsimile number two, look at that, and then uh, uh, you can look at uh, much of what has been written by Egyptologists about this, this crucial symbol uh, at, as it uh, relates to the pantheon of the gods. Any other questions? That bad, huh? 
Go ahead. You can. Yeah. Um, I think one has to be careful not to make too much out of this particular shape. You know, there's been a lot of, of um, I guess, less than accurate stuff that's been written uh, about, you know, the, the effects of the shape of the pyramid and how it can, you know, do everything from cure gout to, uh, you know, whatever. Um, you know, and people should sleep in pyramid-shaped structures and all that kind of thing. Um, but to the ancient Egyptians, there really was something to the pyramid because, as I, I may not have made this as clear as I would have liked, it, it, the, the shape itself represented the slanting rays of, of the sun. And remember, the sun god, Ra, was sort of at the, at the top of the heap, the, the head of the pantheon in at least the New Kingdom of the Empire period, of Egyptian history, and uh, you know he was the patron deity uh, there. So, uh, so Ra is a pretty important uh, deity, a pretty important god, and uh, and yeah, it, it symbolized to the ancient Egyptians the ability of of certainly the kings and the queens and the high nobles um, being able to make their ascent into the realm of the gods where in fact they would sit at the table of Osiris, they would enjoy these sumptuous meals and then they would go out and they would harvest their fields and have the right, uh, you know, the right uh, um, uh, environment to, to do all of that. And then at night they would light their candles and when night came, the ancient Egyptians believed that they could see uh, their, their deceased or their departed lighting the candles as the stars began to appear in the heavens. So, um, yeah, there's, there's some important symbolism there, but how far one takes it, um, I think, is the, is the real question. Uh, and, um, and I guess uh, I'm one that, you know, that would encourage exploration of any particular symbol. Take it as far as you can, except when it comes to the pyramids, because there's so much wacky stuff <laughs> out there. So, please. Uh, did um, the symbolism change much under the um, like monotheism? I guess you could say off and off. That's a that's a good question. Um, Maureen's question goes back to the heretic pharaoh uh, Akhenaten, Amenhotep the fourth, who um, uh, is said to have um, created a system of monotheism, attempting to eradicate the entire pantheon. Of, of deities. The problem with the term monotheism is that uh, that it wasn't monotheistic. <laughs> there were at least two deities in Akhenaten's worldview. One of them was himself. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, the monotheistic reforms, that's one caveat that has to be issued, is that it really wasn't monotheistic at all. Uh, but uh, your particular question about does the symbolism change? Akhenaten attempts to change the symbolism, and in fact, um, some Egyptologists think that maybe the reason that uh, that this figure was, you know, hacked out or, or carved out is because somebody like uh, Akhenaten uh, tried to remove the image. Um, and, and we know that he did in certain areas. I don't think he, he was responsible for this, this particular one, but we know that he tried to, uh, to eradicate the pantheon, to change the symbols so that they would reflect directly on his one true god, which was Aten, the solar disk, uh, hence Akhenaten, um, his name and the name of the new capital, Akhtaten, uh, the horizon of Aten. Um, but he wasn't successful, his reign doesn't last that long, and when the priests of Amun-Ra come back, they come back with a vengeance. And so they eradicate um, Akhenaten's attempts to eradicate. So. Please. Um, I have a question about the 
please. You mentioned the, the symbol of the tree of life. Yeah. Does that have something to do with ISIS? Well, in the in this particular tomb that, that we looked at, the tomb of, of um, Tutmosis the third, ISIS is associated with the life. She is the she is the mother deity. And most cultures of the ancient Near East have a mother deity. I mean, even in the Pearl of Great Price, you can find the Mother Earth uh, you know, image discussed in Moses chapter 7. So that's not a stretch to understand that. But in other places, uh, and the Tree of Life image is found in many, many temples, uh, not so many tombs. I think Tutmosis III is, is the most prominent one in terms of the Tree of Life in a tomb. But on many, many temples, you find... Uh, the tree of life being displayed prominently and the Pharaoh is sitting right in the middle of the tree of life because the tree of life represents uh, uh, as it were that which eternity brings and it's a very very powerful symbol uh, in ancient Egyptian culture as it is in most cultures um, around the world and, uh, and uh, you know whole books have been written about uh, the tree of life symbolism uh, while it's an important uh, and major symbol in ancient Egypt, it's not uh, anywhere nearly as graphically displayed or prominently discussed as in, say, ancient Mesopotamian civilization, where the tree of life often is described as growing up in the midst of the garden, which is in the middle of a sanctuary or temple complex. And always you find in the cultures, the ancient Near East, the tree of life, and, uh, and the sanctuary or the temple being put together, which is really interesting. Okay, one, yes, sir, please. Um, I don't know if you can go back to the final judgment scene, but we were wondering about the figures sitting along the top. Those are different deities, different, different uh, deities that represent different aspects of the gods, the power that they possess, and they're described in, in the hieroglyphic, uh, descriptions near them. Please, sir. You might want to announce that for the Middle East last book when they come around from the National Institution of Yale. Professor Hugh Nibley, who did a lot of work uh, on this, uh, in, in this field, um, uh, is um, thanks to the efforts of the um, Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. I'd like to modestly thank myself for some of that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> kidding. Um, One Eternal Round will be uh, published. Uh, in fact, I think every scrap of paper that's publishable, that's fit to print, and there's some things that aren't fit to print, frankly, but uh, very, very few, but some. Uh, but everything that uh, Professor Nibley worked on will be uh, published, uh, I think, by the time of the 100th. Uh, year celebration of his birth next year, 2010, um, and one eternal round uh, is sort of his magnum opus. One more. You nice people have stayed through all of this. I guess the accurate answer would be it depends on the area uh, that you visit in ancient Egypt today. Certainly those that, that live in a place like Luxor or the Karnak Temple and the Luxor Temple and, and in the, you know, the Valley of the Kings and the Queens are surrounded by this constantly. It can't help but affect uh, their modern outlook or worldview. Those that are far removed from it probably not so much, but, uh, but it's interesting to talk to um, the tour guides uh, and Luxor, as, as many of you know, uh, doesn't have many other industries besides tourism. Uh, it, it has tremendously influenced the view of, say, the tour guides, which are the kind of people I hang around with mostly, um, that and rich students. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it has. It has, and 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 you and you find certain aspects of Islam being emphasized as a result of their contact with, with being surrounded with all of these images 
from millennia gone by. Well, thank you very much. I uh, hope that uh, if we've done nothing else, at least it's stimulated your interest in wanting to make connections between what you understand about eternity and eternal life and what the ancients did as well. And may that be your lifelong quest. See you.